keep the recording and share the link. Yes, sir. Okay. Taking live, sir. All right. Okay. Uh, just want me to start, Prof. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Habis ahri sotri wa yasili amri wa hudah tamilisan ya kongkoli. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, praise, praise to Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious, and uh, let send uh, peace be upon our Rasul, our Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Secondly, I would like to uh, welcome uh, all distinguished participants here. Uh, welcome, brother and sister, to the first lecture in the series of a new approach to Islamic economics. So, Alhamdulillah, we have our professor here joining with us. And uh, this is the first uh, lecture uh, that actually uh, represent and based on the Prof. Asad new book that was launched last year with the title Islamic Economics, Polar Opposite of Capitalist Economics. So this program is hosted in collaboration of uh, the Gosali Project Indonesia in collaboration with Al Nafi Education Platforms. So uh, before I hand over the platform to Prof. Asad, I would like to have a client introduction uh, about him. And of course, most of you are already uh, familiar with him. He graduated from a bachelor of statistics in MIT and a master in statistics from Stanford University and PhD in economics from Stanford and uh, was the vice counselor from uh, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. So as I mentioned that this uh, program is actually part of the Gosali project and a program uh, that would like to explore how to uh, learn and to implement Islamic economics with a new approach. Uh, I would like to uh, share a little bit of my uh, journey about the Gosali project and also a little bit about the, what is the Gosali project before I hand over the platform to Prof. Asad. So um, actually this uh, the Gosali project was initiated by Prasad and I, I my journey to Gosali project was start when uh, I attend Prasad a lecture on how to launch an Islamic revival in 2021. And for me, this uh, lecture was really uh, insightful and mind blowing and uh, enabled me to self reflect on how uh, my, my work view was and uh, enable me to uh, get inside about the, the current problem of the Ummah today and the relevance of the is Imam al approach to our uh, issue today. So uh, this, the lecture we rec recommend for you to, to be also a fan for, for you who have not uh, watched the nine hour lectures. Uh, I recommend that uh, I recommend you to to to, to watch the lecture and also um, this really uh, help us to identify the useful and the useless knowledge and uh, to acknowledge the most important thing is to acknowledge the superiority of the Quran. So uh, I hope that more people can get inside and benefit. So that time I remembered, I uh, asked permission from Professor whether it's possible to, to disseminate, disseminate uh, his work to Bahasa. I, I'm from Indonesia and I'm based in Jakarta. And I hope that more Indonesian people can also read Professor's work. So uh, that time I asked whether it's possible to translate the work. And Alhamdulillah, we launched the, the Gozali Project chapter of Indonesia in October 2021. Uh, this year, we would like to translate Professor book as well, so that a later on can be disseminated to, in Indonesia, we have more than 800 um, program in Islamic economics. Uh, so hopefully, uh, brother and sister who are joining this lecture uh, currently can also join and can also uh, initiate the chapter in your country. It is really a good opportunity for us to get uh, involved in this project and also to be a part of the, the Islamic uh, revivals and in, in the development of Islamic economics, inshallah. So uh, that's my own. 
own experience. And I hope um, most of you who, are, who currently attend this lecture can also the start uh, to uh, initiate the Guzali project chapter in your country. Uh, okay, so later on today, we would like to have a first lecture with the title Gratitude, Containment and Trust in Code, or in Arabic, we uh, name it Sukur, Kona'ah and Tawakul. So actually, as we know, as a uh, introduction, as we know that uh, the teaching of Islamic economics are radically different from those um, th that we got in the, our education from the, in its capitalist perspective. But actually, uh, in reality, it dominates the world today. So uh, today, we would like to learn how this uh, gratitude, contentment, and trust in God can be implemented in the Islamic economics teaching. So without a further ado, I will hand over the platform to our professor. Please, Prof, you can start the lecture. OK, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. And thank you, Lisa, for your introduction. Um, I hope that everybody can speak, uh, can hear me clearly. Uh, we are going yes. to start. Good. I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's see if we have a window. Yeah. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be working very well. Let me try the Chrome tab. All right. Uh, Prof, excuse me, you are still in mute. Okay. Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, so... Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Ala Sayyidul Mursalin. We start by making a sincere intention towards Allah that all our life, our living and dying, should be for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and that we should love Allah Taala and fear Him as is He deserves, and not love anyone else or fear anyone else in a comparable way. Allah Ta'ala, we ask Allah Ta'ala for guidance before we start this study. So <clears throat> we are going to present a new approach to Islamic economics because mostly in the past, uh, Islamic economics has been thought of as a for the past 50 years as a mixture of capitalist economics and um, Islamic teachings. And this uh, effort has failed because uh, we cannot mix opposites. So <clears throat> before I start the lecture, um, there will be one live lecture every month on the first Sundays, same time, same Zulik. Additional materials will be sent on a weekly basis to the members of the mailing list. These will be recorded lectures or, or writings. And there's also course materials will be made available on the Al-Nafe portal uh, via an online course, which is 
freely available. So we start with Allah Ta'ala says to us, which of the favors of Allah Ta'ala will be denied? So the first uh, um, item in this lecture is to develop the feeling of shukr for Allah, to understand the blessings of Allah and to be thankful to Allah for them. Allah Ta'ala says, Wa is the Azana Rabbukum la in Shakartum la Azidanakum, Balain Kafartum in Nazabila Shadid. So, one of the uh, elders has said that most of the Amal we do, the rewards are promised for the Akhir and the Jannah. But this shukr is one Amal for which the reward is promised in this dunya. I will increase you in favor. That is, if we give shukr to Allah, he will increase our blessings in this world. We will see the uh, results of our uh, shukr already in this world. So this is the secret for success in this life, to be thankful to Allah for whatever we have been given. Allah Ta'ala says that, we, we count the blessings of Allah, we can never count them. But this doesn't mean that we should not count. Actually, this means that we should count with the understanding that we cannot ever complete this count. So when we wake up in the mornings, we should be thankful to Allah for giving us life after a miniature death. And we should resolve to make use of this day uh, in the best possible way because we should think that this may be the last day which is given to us. And we should be grateful for health, security, clear mind for the security of food and for the time we have been given and for energy and for all of the blessings that we have at the same time knowing that we cannot count these blessings. Our Prophet Muhammad is the perfect example for us in all dimensions. So there is a hadith that the Prophet would pray all night until his feet were swollen. So it was said to him that, why do you do this when Allah Ta'ala has forgiven all your past and your future sins? So the Prophet Sallallahu said that, shall I not be a grateful servant? So we should worship Allah Ta'ala with a feeling of gratitude that this opportunity has been given to us. As a personal example from my own life, I used to feel very lazy in getting up for Fajr Salat. And then I remembered a verse from Iqbal which says that uh, that you do not love me, Allah Ta'ala is addressing us, but you love the comfort of your knee, of your sleep, which has been given to you by Allah. So when I would recite this verse, it would motivate me that how, what kind of a man am I that I am uh, being ungrateful to my Allah for the little command that has, he has given me when uh, he has given me such huge favors. So uh, there is a hadith which says that if you adopt these two habits, you will be counted among the people who are grateful. And the two habits are that in worldly affairs, look to those who have less than you and give thanks for all that you have. And in matters of the deen, look to those who have more than you and seek to follow them. If you do that, Allah Ta'ala will count you among those who have uh, who are, who are uh, thankful and also those who are content with what they have been given, those who have sabr. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ told us that we should be grateful for the small things because whoever is not grateful for the little things will not be grateful for the large things. And whoever does not thank the people for the favors they do to him has not thanked Allah Ta'ala. So every day we should be thankful that we have been given this additional opportunity to buy Jannah with good deeds. And uh, one must remember that success lies today. We are used to thinking that, oh, I will make a long-term plan and when I graduate and then I have a career and then I have a house, this will be success. This is a very uh, false idea. Success we can achieve today if we do the things that Allah Ta'ala wants us to do. And we also fail today if we fail to do. So the, at the end of the day, the record book for the deeds of that day will be closed. And if we have managed to get good things written onto this day, 
then we have succeeded. And if we have not, then we have failed. Ingratitude, lack of shukr, comes from excess. And Allah Ta'ala has given us a number of verses that if Allah Ta'ala gives lots of things to the people, they become rebellious. And this is especially the example of the Qarun, who was given so many treasures that his servants had to carry them, uh, the keys to them. And he swelled up with pride. And when asked to give a zakat, he said that, no, I, I'm entitled to this because I have earned it due to my own knowledge. So this is the um, this is the lack of gratitude to Allah Ta'ala, which we must avoid. And especially if we have been given many blessings, this is uh, we are prone to fall into neglect because we are so comfortable. And so we must fight this tendency. Allah Ta'ala has also said that do not covet what Allah Ta'ala has given to others more than you. Why we feel if somebody has a bigger house or a bigger job or a bigger title or more money, we feel jealous. Uh, this comes from a feeling of uh, deserving, that I deserve more. And if you think of yourself as the worst person on the planet, then you will not have kibr. And then you will say that whatever I have been given is more than what I deserve. And if you see somebody who has uh, who is in worse condition, you should make dua to Allah Ta'ala that, Allah, thank to Allah Ta'ala that you have, Allah Ta'ala has protected you from that, even though you deserved worse than that. And if you see somebody better off than that, then you should make dua to Allah Ta'ala that, oh Allah Ta'ala, make this trial easy for him or her. Because uh, excess wealth is a, a, a difficult trial from Allah Ta'ala. So, Allah Ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبَّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرْ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقُهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَحَانًا So Allah Ta'ala says both of these things, that if you give a lot of wealth to somebody, this is a trial. And uh, people forget and think that Allah Ta'ala has honored me. Actually, having more than what you need is not, is not an honor from Allah Ta'ala. It is a, a trial. And if you succeed in that trial, this is a great blessing to have excess wealth. And if you fail, it is uh, harmful for you. Similarly, having less than what you need is also a trial. It is not a sign that Allah Ta'ala doesn't like you. And people misunderstand this. So the second uh, attitude that we must learn to cultivate is contentment. Abu Huraira narrates that true wealth is not having uh, material, it is uh, the contentment of the heart. So there is a deep strategy for learning how to be content with what, what you have. And that is the, that uh, to understand that success lies in obeying the orders of Allah, not in achieving, not in having uh, materials or having titles or having jobs or having uh, wife and children. Uh, none of these Worldly possessions is success. Success is only in, find, in obeying the orders of Allah in the situation that you are. Today we have a lifetime of training which teaches us to think in the opposite way. We have learned to think that only if you have a degree, only if you have a job, only if you are married, only if you have a large amount of wealth. These are the criteria for success. And so we have to work for five years or 10 years or 20 years to achieve those states, and then we can be successful. This is a complete illusion, and uh, this leads to discontent. We are not happy with what we have because we want more, and this leads to lack of gratitude towards Allah. So whatever the external circumstances are, those are the best for us. Allah Ta'ala has put us in these for our benefit, and we have to appreciate what we have been given, and we have to understand the test that we have been placed in, and we have to learn to take the action which will bring us closer to Allah in the situation that we are in. Not try to change the situation for a better situation. Because there is no better situation. So uh, we have to learn process thinking versus outcome thinking. We are used to thinking in terms of uh, the one who wins is successful. But actually, uh, it's all about how you play the game. 
in this game, uh, uh, the king and the peasant are equally uh, capable of passing and of failing. Even a small piece of date as a sadqa can bring the reward of uh, mountains of Ahad. And sacrificing one's whole life in holy jihad can be useless if you have the wrong intentions. So all circumstances are equally tests for us, although some tests are harder and some are easier. So Allah Ta'ala has told us the purpose of this life. Allazi khalaqal mawta wal hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala wa huwa al-azizu al-ghafoor. So our goal in life is to collect the best deeds. And uh, there is a, this ayat was revealed on a very uh, particular situation when Abu Aqil a sahabi gave a small handful of dates. So some of the hypocrites mocked him that uh, lots of people are bringing so much uh, wealth to this uh, Tabuk expedition and you are just giving a little bit. So the Prophet وسلم, appreciated his efforts because he had worked all night to earn a handful of dates to give for Tabuk. And Allah Ta'ala also revealed this ayat to support uh, this Sahabi. That, um, so even a small, a handful of dates given a sadqa is worthy of the praise of Allah Ta'ala and his Prophet So it's not that how much we have, it's the intention in, heart, in our hearts and the amal that we can do with it. So the smallest of deeds done with sincerity counts heavily with Allah and the greatest deed done without sincerity counts for nothing. So the Quran tells us that the life of this world is just a small um, piece of time. There is a specific ayat that the wealth and the sons are the uh, allurements of this life. But the rewards for the deeds that we do are those things which will last forever. And these are the best. And Allah Ta'ala says that life of this in dunya is mataul gurur. It's just an illusion. So when we focus on life of this world and we think of what we don't have, then we become ungrateful. But if we focus on the hereafter and realize that this life is only for a moment, then we will be able to uh, do the deeds which Allah Ta'ala wants from us. So how can we learn to be content with what we have been given? Uh, one of the things is to never complain about our situation. Whatever the environment, whatever the uh, situation, we should give thank to Allah Ta'ala that he has placed us in this situation and imagine that things could be even worse. And we should concentrate on doing good deeds and making Allah Ta'ala happy and serve the creation of Allah for the sake of love of Allah. These, this is the best of deeds. Finally, the third topic in terms of the qualities that we are taught is tawakkul, or trust in Allah Ta'ala. And there are several ayat in the Quran about trust. Uh, but uh, what perhaps one of the most important is that if we trust in Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala will be enough for us in all circumstances. Allah Ta'ala asks us to trust him if we are believers and Rabbul Mashriq wal Maghrib la ilaha illa hu fattakhiz hu wakila. So Allah Ta'ala says that he is in control of the east and the west. He, know, he has power over everything. So we should try to get his help instead of trying to seek other sources for support. So one of the Consequences of this is that we should never have regrets over what might have been. Because Allah Ta'ala says, Ma asaba min musibatin fil arze wala fi anfasikam illa fi kitabim min qabli an nabra aha. In nazalik alallahi yasir. So everything that bad that happens has already been written. There was no way that we could avoid it. So to think that, oh, if I had only done this. Uh, suppose somebody is in a car accident, suppose that I had taken some other route or maybe if I had slammed on the brakes or something like that, this is just useless. If it's written for you, it would have to happen. And uh, Allah Ta'ala says that this is so that you do not, uh, you do not become sad about what might have been. And also if you get something, <clears throat> you do not become proud that I have earned this. This was written for you also. 
So once we learn to have trust in Allah Ta'ala, we will not have any anxiety or worry. We will carry out the orders of Allah and put our trust in Allah that he will create the best of situations. And even if what happens is very, appears very harmful, uh, we should learn to believe that Allah Ta'ala has hidden great khair in them. So my father used to tell a story about how he was going for, for a, uh, admission to an engineering college and he had a large amount of money with him, which had been given to him by father. And then some pickpocket picked his pocket and he had no money left. And he felt ashamed to go back to his father. So he took admission in a very low grade um, university compared, very low ranked English uh, university, which the tuition was cheap. And that eventually led to a very highly favorable outcome, much better than those which the engineers in his batch got to. So many times very bad things happen, but Allah Ta'ala is hidden in those bad things, very uh, big blessings. And there are many stories which teach us this lesson. So we should just learn to believe that if something bad has happened, Allah Ta'ala has hidden some great blessing in this. All troubles occur for a reason. One of the awliyaullah said that sometimes you are put into difficulty and it causes forgiveness of his sins. And this is a great blessing in the Akhirah because you will not be tested for them. And Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran that sometimes we turn uh, give trouble to people so that they will turn towards me. So this is also Allah Ta'ala is calling you towards him. If we are in trouble, then we turn to Allah with uh, khulus in our hearts and we ask from the bottom of our hearts, Oh Allah Ta'ala, help me. And this itself is a great blessing. And sometimes there are no sins and people are already like the prophets, والسلام, they are also facing great trouble, but they have no sins and they are already in close communication with Allah Ta'ala. So in these cases, the trouble is given to elevate their degrees to give them higher status, higher rank. So in all cases, any trouble, any problem that comes to us is a source of great blessing for us. So um, there are great promises of Allah Ta'ala and we should learn to trust these promises more than we trust in money and in power and in circumstances. Today we think that a big doctor will help me and uh, I have a lot of money, I can use that. No. We should put our trust in the promises of Allah. And whoever trusts Allah, Allah Ta'ala will be enough for him. And if we have taqwa, Allah Ta'ala will find a way for us out of any difficulty. And this way will be from where we do not expect. This is a very strange thing that the, we are used to thinking about asbab. Uh, this means and that means, but those are all visible. Allah Ta'ala will find us a way without the asbab. He will uh, create a way just like he created a way for Musa alayhi salam by parting the waters. So this promise is like that, that it will not seem like there is any way, but Allah Ta'ala will create a path for us if we have taqwa. So this is the end of part one on um, shukr and qanaat and tawakkul. And uh, now I will go to part two. Anyone who has had a regular course in economics will have many questions about this because uh, uh, even those who are not economists will have problems, uh, some questions, but economists especially will have a lot of questions. And so um, I will uh, not be able to deal with all of them, but I will deal with a few of them. So the first question which economists ask when um, given some lecture like this is that they say that economic theory is positive. It actually describes what you are talking about is an ideal, which is imaginary. Nobody is like that. So um, uh, we are comparing apples and oranges. We are comparing a positive theory to a normative theory and that's not fair. So actually uh, the truth is that economic theory is not positive as it claims. Um, the objection given to our um, presentation is that uh, it's uh, prescriptive. It, it tells us how one to behave, but science is actually positive. It, science just describes reality. It doesn't tell us what to do. And uh, since modern economics is positive, it is complementary to what I am saying that 
it describes reality and I'm telling how we should be and modern economics describes how we are. So the truth is that modern economics is also normative. Modern economics tells us that rational behavior consists of maximizing the pleasure we obtain from consumption of goods and services. So this is also a theory of behavior. Is this actually true? Is this how people behave? Well, uh, psychologists who study uh, behavior tested these theories and found that people do not behave like that. So what we have done really is say that this is theory of rational behavior. This is how intelligent people should behave. So it is a normative theory about what economists consider rational. And why do they consider it rational? Well, it's rational to maximize pleasure in this world because if you reject God and judgment day and afterlife, then you only have this world. So of course you should maximize pleasure. And that is what they do. And that's what they mean by rationality. So this is rational for someone who rejects God, but it is not rational for someone who does not, uh, who believes in Allah. And there is overwhelming empirical evidence that all people, not just Muslims, nobody behaves like what the economists think they do. So there is a specific game, very simple, which I often carry out in my classes. This is a virtual class, so I can't do it, but you can imagine. Uh, uh, imagine that uh, there is a large pile of money in front of you, and there are two people. You are one of them, and the other, there is another person. The experimenter has given you $1,000 in uh, cash notes, and he says that, okay, you can divide this money between yourself and the other person. And you are, uh, you are in complete control. You can divide as you like. If you take all of it, nobody can stop you. So when this game has actually been done, uh, many people actually divide half and half. And almost nobody uh, takes everything. Although what does economic theory says? Economic theory says that everyone will take everything because everyone is selfish and they want to maximize their own wealth. So they will take all of the thousand dollars. But very few people, only, only, uh, only those people who have training in economics do this. And even those, uh, only a few of them. So this automatically proves that the economic theory of behavior that you try to maximize your, your share and your wealth and your pleasure is not true. People care about other people. So the empirical evidence strongly rejects the economic theory of behavior. So it's not a positive theory. This is what I want to say. Even though it claims to be a positive theory, even though it claims to describe behavior, it does not actually describe behavior. And most people are not like that, although a few are. So what are the major areas of conflict between how economics describes human behavior and how people actually behave? According to economic theory, humans are selfish, competitive, they calculate the, uh, the last element that of, of profits that they can, and they don't, they're not moved by emotions. The reality is that human beings are generous, cooperative, and they often take decisions on the basis of emotion, which uh, um, overrides calculations of self-interest. So there are many examples of this in the prisoner's dilemma, very famous game. If people cooperate, they get good outcome. But if someone betrays the other, he gets the best possible outcome, but the other person is harmed. So economic theory says that selfish people will betray the other one and both will end up in a bad position. But the, if the actual people don't do that, and economists have been working for 50 years on how to explain how people cooperate when they are really selfish. But this is all uh, silly because the basic axiom of their behavior that people are selfish is false. And that's why they're having problems in understanding cooperative behavior. So the conclusion of this is that economic theory claims to be positive, but it is in fact normative. It does not describe human behavior. It pre prescribes an ideal of rational behavior, which is very different from the ideals of Islamic behavior. So we are not actually doing different things. The economists also have an ideal theory of behavior. But this ideal theory of behavior is exactly the opposite of what Islamic ideal theory is. And actually, there are many papers which show that people who are trained in economics learn how to be selfish. 
whereas people without training in economics are less selfish so uh this uh, leads to three questions uh that i will try to answer in the remaining part of the lecture it is well established that utility maximization theory does not work psychologists have rejected this theory overwhelmingly it is not a descriptive theory but still economic textbooks all over the world continue to use this theory nobody teaches microeconomics on the basis of behavioral economics they always use this utility maximization theory and um okay so the second question is that okay suppose we agree that economics is also normative when islamic economics is also normative then why don't we go to a positive theory science is after all positive <coughs> and the third question which is also related is that even muslims don't have these qualities <coughs> so how can we build a theory based on utopian ideals this doesn't if this doesn't exist in reality then what is the point of such a theory this is just a ideal which can never actually be achieved <coughs> so let me uh answer this first question why do economists use clear to date black money analysis <coughs> so um uh first let me document that uh there is an article by romer written recently after the global financial crisis saying that macroeconomics has been going backwards we used to know more but we have been losing knowledge after the financial crisis the queen of england went to london school of economics to ask the economists why did no one see that this was about to happen so <clears throat> there are many many leading economists who said that economics as a whole is in uh, big trouble because nobody could no economist could predict this global financial crisis so why is that <clears throat> we are uh, looking at why do economists start keep using failed theories so one of the keys to understanding is the <clears throat> keynesian revolution and the monetarist counter revolution this graph is a picture of what happened in the 20th century so <clears throat> uh neoclassical theory a classical theory dominated until 1929 when the great depression took place after the great depression which took classical economists by surprise <clears throat> nobody had foreseen that that would happen and uh the theory said that it could not happen and then there was long uh, unemployment and again economic theory says that that cannot happen because the labor market will equilibrate there will be no unemployment a free market will automatically create full employment <clears throat> so one of the key points of keynesian theory was that the free market does not create full employment and the government must intervene to create full employment so when this was done and the banks were regulated there was a about a 50 year period of prosperity when the masses uh, the share of income of the masses increased the bottom 90% and the share of the top 1% which is in the middle of this graph started to decrease so the top 1% plotted a counter -re revolution when i was studying in the 1970s the chicago school was considered a school of crackpots they did not do serious economics they were ideologues but now the opposite is true keynesians are considered crackpots and the chicago schools are firmly uh, dominant throughout the profession <clears throat> so the there was a coup that was engin engineered against uh, keynesian economics and uh, this had the desired effect the if you look at the blue line the share of the top 1% started to rise and it is at very high levels today with uh, less than 50 people owning half of the wealth of the planet <clears throat> so the um, main insight here is that capitalism works by not by forcibly exploiting laborers but by making the laborers agree to their own exploitation and this agreement is created by education 
uh, into false economic theories. Modern economic theory is a tool of propaganda which is built to create the impression that our extremely bad economic system is the best for all peoples. So uh, there are many, many different techniques which are used to carry out this propaganda. And uh, one of these is the uh, deceptive Now, the thing is that uh, economics is still a branch of moral philosophy, but this has been hidden. This has been concealed under the pretense that economics is an objective description of reality. It is actually trying to say how things should be, but it says that this is actually how things are, which is false. <clears throat> so one very specific example of how economics is deceptive is the production function. Uh, there's a very nice article by Bergman, uh, and she writes that when um, economists study the behavior of, bottle, uh, of bottlenose dolphins, they spent hundreds of hours watching what bottlenose dolphins actually do. But if you look at economic theory of the firm, it is based on zero study of real world firms. Economists just uh, use pencil and paper and just make up these theories without ever actually looking at any real world firms. <clears throat> there is a book by Alan Blinder, which has a survey of real firms asking about prices. And he says that what we learn by asking the firms about how you set prices contradicts everything that you find in the textbooks. In particular, in the theory of supply and demand for firm, one of the key elements is that firms are price takers. But Alan Blinder finds that most of the firms are price setters. So the theories of the firm given in the economics textbooks do not apply to most of the firms who, in the real world. So again, we come up with the same questions. Why do economists persist in presenting false theories to students all over the world? <clears throat> so that's because the real arguments that we are, uh, the economists are trying to make are concealed behind a wall of mathematics. Marx argued that capitalists exploit labor, but when you look at the production function, which is a big mathematical thing, and nobody understands what is actually being done, but basically what is being done is that the production function teaches us that both the capitalists and the laborers earn their own marginal product. The laborers earn the marginal product of labor, and the capitalists earn the marginal product of capital, which means that they both get their just reward. They are they are getting what they deserve because of their contribution to the output. Now, as I've said, this, the, the, this works only when you have a competitive market and not when capitalists are big and laborers uh, are uh, multiple and have no power. But also the mathematics that is done is actually wrong. You can find mistakes in the error, uh, mistakes because uh, the total product cannot actually be allocated to both labor and it doesn't add up. The marginal product of labor and the marginal product of capital does not add up in many different real world cases. So by a lot of hocus pocus, economists have convinced, convinced uh, uh, students that uh, capitalists are getting a fair share and laborers are getting a fair share, uh, mainly by hiding this behind a wall of mathematics, which no one understands. So basically, anywhere you look, you find that there are norms hidden underneath, and there is a pretense that uh, that the concept is objective. So scarcity, which is the foundation of uh, modern economics, is also one such concept. Uh, scarcity arises when you confuse needs and wants as economists do. They say that the goal of economics is to fulfill all the needs and the wants. But actually, if you look at Islamic teachings, Islam encourages the fulfillment of needs. Uh, so eat and drink and wear your nice uh, clothings. So a, lo a lot of consumption, which is useful, is permissible. But 
ولا تشرف ولا تلا فربج إشراف الفربج تش تبزير and he says that Allah Taala says in the Quran that if you follow your idle desires you will go to Jahannam so wants are you cannot follow your wants so if you follow the Quranic prescription that if you have more than what you need you should give that access to those who have need and this was done in the Islamic civilization for a thousand years the waqf uh, used to actually give um, uh, well, the, the rich people took their excess money and created waqf and the waqf was used to provide social services to the society so today what happens when you uh, when a rich person has excess wealth is he puts it in the bank and he gets more wealth which is a useless thing to do so the fundamental economic problem is not scarcity the fundamental economic problem is greed which is created by capitalism and the antidote to this problem is these qualities which you have discussed if we develop tawakkul qanaat and uh, and uh, uh, contentment and gratitude shukr to allah then we will not uh, be always wanting more and more and then we will be happy to give from our wealth to those who do not have because that is a, a great amal it is a it is something which is pleasing to allah so i have discussed this issue in scarcity east and west about how western treatment of scarcity is very different from the eastern scarcity treatment and this is eastern because it is more than islamic this is how all civilizations have viewed the matter except for the uh, western capitalism which arose only recently so the second issue is that that the second question that I would like to address is that uh, uh, we might say that uh, science is positive <clears throat> not normative so okay so uh, islam has one set of ideals and capitalism has another set of ideals uh, and they are opposites but both of them are ideals but science should be about what really happens in the real world so there we have a interesting uh, problem that actually when we use science science is about uh, is uh, the starts with physics chemistry biology so these things are subject to laws man has free will and so you can write a law of motion for a planet but you cannot write a law of motion you cannot write down an equation which describes the behavior of a real human being you can only describe the behavior of robots by calculation but you cannot describe the behavior of real human beings uh in fact this is fairly obvious to prove that you cannot apply the method of physical science to the study of human beings and um many people have written books and essays about why this is true uh i have uh, i have listed some of these books in my essay which is linked here and 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 this is more or less obvious this is not a deep and difficult mistake actually if you think a little bit about it what is social science it tells you how to organize society but which society well social science comes from lessons that europeans learned from their own historical experience about how to organize european society so that's fine europeans can apply this to the european society why do they say the word science because when you say science there is a claim that this is universally applicable and this is simply not true uh the reason for this mistake uh is fairly deep <clears throat> and uh i cannot cover it here in this essay uh in this lecture uh, but basically it happens because uh, there were many methodological mistakes which were made in european intellectual tradition there were uh, wars between uh, protestants and catholics for more than 100 years so that led them to reject christianity as a basis for organizing society and that led them to create social science as an alternative to christianity for organizing society and so basically if you ponder over the implications of this you get to understand that social science is really the religion of europe 
that came into existence after the rejection of Christianity. So once you understand, so it represents certain beliefs. It, uh, it represents the rejection of God, judgment, afterlife, and then it thinks of life as a meaningless um, thing. Uh, we will all die, and so there is no meaning to our lives. And so life is then a jungle of competition, and uh, survival of the fittest is the only morality. And so this is all. This is all what. Uh, what social science is built on. These are the moral foundations of modern social science. So the third question is that, uh, and we are coming to the end of our lecture, that, uh, okay, uh, I accept that social science is bad and economics is bad, but uh, what will it gain us? How do we really understand the world if we talk about these qualities, um, shukr and tawakkul and qanaat, even most Muslims don't have that. And in the world we are looking at it, even in Muslim countries, there are lots of non-Muslims. So if you want to understand the world, we have to go outside of these uh, boundaries. And so we can't, we can't develop a theory of economics on the basis of these qualities that uh, we have talked about. So that's actually, uh, we need to, the, the social science uh, methodology is completely failed and it has not produced the social science which has been helpful. In fact, this social science has led to continuous wars and war against uh, the environment, a climate catastrophe, breakup of families, all sorts of uh, difficult uh, concentration of wealth in a few hands. So this social science, if you judge by the outcomes it has produced has been very much a failure. So we have to rethink the whole process. We can't build on the same grounds. We have to reject this whole social science and rebuild from scratch. So um, after looking onto this more deeply, we find that actually Ibn Khaldun laid down the foundations for how to do social science, which are very different from modern social science. So in particular, um, I have proposed the name Ulum al-Umran in honor of Ibn Khaldun and uh, also to, uh, to signal that we are rejecting the Western approaches uh, by using the Arabic word. We are going back to our own traditions, which we ne need to do, not just in economics, but in all of the social sciences. And um, I have discussed uh, this in greater detail in a number of articles, uh, reference in the link, but I'm going to, for this purpose of this lecture, uh, the framework of social science, uh, if we do it in Ulum al-Imran approach, is a three-dimensional approach. We have a positive dimension, which describes what things are like. And this will include all sorts of you know, failure of Muslims to live up to Islam. That's the descriptive part. But we also have a normative part, the prescriptive part, how we want the ideal uh, that we want uh, to work towards. And then we have a third part, which is the transformative part. It tells us about how we can take the actual observed reality and move it towards the normative ideal. So all three parts are essential to social sciences. And actually, if you look closely at economics, modern economics, you see that it has all three parts. It also talks, it's the ideal is a perfectly competitive market, but it recognizes that the world is not perfectly competitive. And then it provides some strategies for how you can regulate monopolies and how you can do things to move things towards the competitive ideal. So all social science has to follow this because human beings have to, when you look at a society and you're trying to describe it, it's always with reference to some ideal, with reference to where you want to go. So uh, we have described an ideal behavior <clears throat> and this is unattainable, but this is not a problem. Our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is ideal for us in all dimensions, but we know that we cannot be like him. We cannot achieve his excellence in all dimensions. So does that mean his uh, seerah is useless? Of course not. Basically, it gives us the direction for our struggles. It tells us in which way to go, even though we will never get to the final destination, if we walk along this path, then we will achieve the hasanat. So 
um, we will describe an ideal society according to Islamic ideals, and then we will work to create such a society. But we are not discouraged if we never get to that uh, perfect ideal. As long as we work, uh, as long as we struggle, Allah Ta'ala looks at our struggle. And he has given us guidance on how we should struggle. But he does not look for the outcome, whether you are Shaheed or whether you are Ghazi. It doesn't matter. The outcome can be failure or success in worldly terms. But you are always successful if you join the struggle. So I think this is the final slide almost. Uh, there is a deeper issue which I have not touched here, but which lies at the bottom of all of this. Uh, <clears throat> in, in the West, they have a theory of knowledge which emphasizes the knowledge of the external world, what is out there, what is objective. But our um, Islamic tradition combines the objective and the subjective. It says that we cannot understand the objective except in relation to the subjective. And so the primary basis for learning is experience. My experience, which I am telling you about, uh, although I have described it in abstract terms, uh, if I was to do a different type of lectures, I would illustrate all of these qualities that we have discussed in abstract by explaining my own experience with them, how I learned the, vakul, how the struggles that I had to go through and what are the problems that face me so that you can identify with my experience and learn from it and maybe improve upon it. And um, the, uh, the experience that we have is based on our hearts and our spirit and the nafs, which is the desire and our minds, which is the aql. Now, uh, this is a four-dimensional model for Islamic psychology, which originates with Imam al-Ghazali. And today, Islamic psychologists are making a lot of progress by building on these uh, because Western psychology does not include the heart and the soul. It only includes the desires and the aql. And so those, uh, by including these, we get a much deeper understanding of human psyche. And understanding the human psyche is the basis for all social science. So we have the opportunity in front of us to launch a revolution, not just in economics, but in all fields of social sciences, because we are, have an intellectual tradition which has a much deeper knowledge of human beings than what the economic theory tells us, that human beings simply uh, solve a mathematical formula to learn how, they, how to act, uh, and they maximize utility which is a completely absurd theory of human behavior. So having much deeper and much more wiser and more profound theory allows us to build a much more solid superstructure. So let us conclude with the dua. Rabbi zidni ilma. Allahum in yasaluka ilman nafi'u. Allahum anfa'mini bima allamtani. Allamni ma yanfa'ni. Arzuqni ilman tanfa'ni bihi. So uh, we, and, uh, we ask Allah for his guidance and his blessings and his nur of hadaya, which will lead us to uh, the knowledge that we seek. That is the end of my lecture. MashaAllah. Jazakallah uh, khair, Professor, for the insightful lecture. Now we are coming to the question and answer session. Uh, previously, there were several names here who raised rain. Now we can uh, proceed to the question and answer. So I invite, okay, here we have Dr. Henry Tanju. <laughs> Please. Uh... Henry, go ahead and can you unmute yourself? Uh, do I, ah, yes. Go ahead and ask, yes. Yes, Henry. Uh... Uh, Henry, we cannot hear your voice. Okay, we're waiting for Pa Henry. Uh, is there Hello? anyone who? Yes. yes? Uh, Hello. Yeah, Pa Henry. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. This is very uh, interesting topics that I'm looking for actually for uh, ten years after completing PhD from Islamabad. <laughs> okay. now, uh, now I'm I'm joining Indonesian Wakaf Board, sir. So when you uh, this 
describe about wakaf and its role i think we should explore more about wakaf and also uh, the impact of wakaf in economic development sir thank you sir yes definitely wakf uh, is the central financial institution in an islamic economy just like the bank is central to western economies uh, because when you have excess wealth in a capitalist economy you invest it and try to make more but in an islamic economy when you have excess wealth you give it to the others as per orders of the quran okay yes. thank you thank you kahendri and prafasad yes we have uh, brother Raisa. muhammad here so oh. yes brother muhammad Okay, I think Faisal got code. Yeah, I see. Assalamu alaikum. First hand. Oh, Muhammad Hassan Tariq. Okay, go ahead. Sir, my English is not good. Can I speak Urdu? Can I talk in Urdu? Okay, but make it quick because uh, there is an international audience. Sir, I wanted to ask you. Sir, I wanted to ask you that I am trading. I have started my career in trading and it is going well. I wanted to ask you that trading is going well. But these questions, please, 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 ask separately because that's your personal question i would like to of this lecture okay sir bas na ek thoda sa bas bata de ke maine apna career ke aage please uh, yani mute yourself and uh, let's give a question to others because this is about the lecture not about your personal issues right assalamu alaikum jazakallah um i i will take the next uh, um, question to you sheikh yes, uh, zaman um yes a fantastic quotation from quran and your analysis of uh, economic uh, theory today as well as uh, the solutions that islam provides uh, one of the realities we facing uh, is that while we do all of this like you correctly said we we look at the outcome uh, that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides we we try our best and we trust in him Uh, so while that is going on we do know that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and quran teaches us that we should change the condition our condition and we should uh, if we have iman we should strongly uh, physically get involved in changing the condition if we are weak in iman we should speak against what is unjust and if we are even weaker then at least we should feel in our heart so we as uh, muslims striving to be mu'minin who want to do what is right we have a big challenge in the economic situation while we do what you are saying and that is the bretton woods institutions like the world bank and imf and un they have the banking structure imposed on the entire world and how do we go about changing it so from south africa india and a few countries there have been moves to try and have the veto in the united nations security council neutralized or at least uh, become fair i mean they claim democracy and equality but it's not there So my question to you is while we do what you're saying can we not in parallel have our 57 muslim countries and alliances with the african union the arab league asean the whole of the malaya region move for a new un or a change in the in the in the bretton wood rules that gives the united states and the uk uh, the veto over everyone else jazakallah khair this is a very good question and uh, many people will have similar questions So let me answer it in a uh, way different from uh, what the standard answers would be. Uh, the work of Wael Halak on the impossible state shows that this nation state itself is a creation of the West. It did not exist. We we think that there is a continuity, but it is not. I mean, our um, polities were structured in different way from very differently from modern nation nation states. This. Uh, a uh, nation state is actually highly un-islamic and it is incompatible with islamic because basically it was created to divide the ummah these states were created specifically to divide muslims and keep them fighting among each other and that's what we are doing so one cannot use un-islamic means to create islamic outcomes so uh, this doesn't mean uh, of course we have to struggle but the struggle should be on in different dimensions and in fact there are many open dimensions for us to struggle on the basis of the collectivity of the ummah 
and uh, but but we are not looking because our eyes have been trained by western social science to think in terms of nation and united nation and world bank and imf we can create our own institutions which are very different from anything conceived of by western um, scholars because they are looking at their own history they created their own institutions we have our own history we have our own institutions and we have our own methods of bringing social change i was um, watching these lectures recently with this historian and he said you know these uh, early muslims they were amazing they took on the uh, empire of uh, persia and of uh, rome both of them thousand year old empires old and they took them on both at the same time and they defeated them and they completely they disappeared from history this is an incredible event it could not have happened uh, it's just uh, hard to believe how this could happen so basically allah taala is all powerful these entities that we think of as powerful the imf the world bank they do not have the power to uh, kill a fly or to take back um, a, a, a grain of uh, of sugar if a fly steals it from them they do not have the power that is in a skin of a date a seed uh, as the quran says so this is an illusion la ilaha illa is uh, the, the the asa of musa defeated the thousands of magicians so as long as we struggle along the right lines and we trust in allah so today the problem is that we are struggling on, on the wrong dimensions the ones that allah taala does not want and we are not making the struggle in the right dimensions which will lead us to the which will give us the help of allah so allah taala says if we are divided among yourselves then allah taala help will not come to you so we have to work on creating the bonds of ummah we have to build this uh bond and this bond can be built without the help of nations in fact the nations will be very harmful because when you start thinking about pakistan and iran and then you're thinking of pakistan as an entity you're saying okay i will work for pakistan and let the turkish muslims work for turkey and so this is actually dividing the ummah and reducing our strength and as the quran says then your strength will go away from you if you start dividing the ummah so um there are ways out of the box today we are not thinking out of the box because we are thinking within the boxes created by social science of the west so this is just a beginning like if you look at all of the textbooks of uh, economics throughout the world including those written by muslims and including those mentioning islamic e economy you will not find uh, these qualities at the heart of your you will not find any mention of these qualities even though these are the at the heart of consumer theory so until we uh, decolonize our minds we cannot think clearly to learn what the instructions of allah taala are and how we can implement them and if we just instructions of allah taala are and how we implement them allah taala will solve the other problems that we seem to face yes so uh, can we take the next question now ayaz kiani i see on my screen uh, let me ask to unmute yes uh, assalamu alaikum dr zaman wa alaikum assalam uh, so i mean i have uh, more than one but i just ask my first question and maybe that's all you have time for so when it comes to our own eschatological narrative we have that on the day of judgment everyone will be going nafsi nafsi just about mm -hmm. themselves and uh, i mean doesn't know so that there is actually at the very bottom of our of our uh, you know make up our psychology that greed actually is or i mean selfishness actually is very fundamental and that's what we're saying so and the only difference being then not one of rationality but the fact that western economics is not taking into account that there will be a hereafter as well and if we took that into account that rationality might actually work well i think that the descriptions in the quran and the hadith are very clear that we have been built with these two dimensions if we, if we had no desires if we had no greed if we had no uh, evil temptation towards evil then there would be 
so there is a struggle our our soul is attracted towards the high things and our nafs is attracted towards the low things and uh, this is a battle and in this battle winning means to uphold the high and uh, avoid the low and um, both of both of these tendencies are present only the west is uh, western economics is about nafs amara and um, islamic economics is about how we can change the nafs amara to nafs lawama and nafs mutmainna and i have described this in one of my papers uh, which is called islam's gift an economy of spiritual development okay so let me ask uh, amreen sultan assalam alaikum dr saman um, my alaykum. question is that uh, um, uh, the 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 normative ideal that we want to envision uh, can it will it be a static one or like it can be an evol- evolving one because to accommodate the mod- uh, modern needs Uh, for example i read the um, latest book by steve keen new economics he says that uh, uh, if i am asked to, how much to take uh, of the new ecological ex- economics i'll say i don't want to take anything from it like uh, it's uh, useless so um, can you please um, yes sure uh, on the individual level we know that um, there are different stages of uh, spiritual progress and um, so um uh, different command uh, strategies for spiritual development apply to different uh, people and so definitely on an individual level there is a lot of variation at all times there are people at uh, very different stages of spiritual development and they will be doing acting behaving in different ways and their strategies will be different and similarly for the society as a whole uh there will be different stages of development and uh, uh different strategies to use at different stages all right next uh, umar malik assalam alaikum thank you dr sir wa alaikum uh, uh, this is a, a very informative lecture and uh, really appreciate you your efforts uh, my question is Uh, that uh, first time i have um, uh, uh, you got, got the information about the islamic economics uh, but i have been uh, uh, practicing islamic banking for the last 20 years uh, so uh, what you said in the lecture uh, uh, what i assume is the uh, the practicing what we are practicing islamic banking is totally different uh, because uh, the motive is uh, that the uh, to gain the profitability here you explain yes. that uh, we have to uh, obey the orders of allah in the way uh, or the teachings and we don't have to uh, get the uh, the outcome the result uh, or the profits uh, but in islamic banking what uh, we see and what we practice is that by doing all uh, the things and the efforts the ultimate uh, motive is to get the profit so uh, how how you uh, please uh, uh, give uh, exp- and explain that is this the present islamic banking which uh, is in practice uh, in the pakistan and in the rest of the world uh, is uh, according to the islamic uh, economic uh, system or uh, not uh yes um, uh this is a good question today um our uh, we have just uh, discussed the abc's islamic banking will be discussed i have some lectures on uh, islamic banking and i have described a new vision for islamic banks which explains how uh, we can um, reform islamic banking to bring it along and it has to do with exactly what you said that instead of seeking to make profits in this dunya we can learn to run islamic firms on the basis of providing service to mankind while ensuring enough profits to make sure that the institution can run comfortably instead of maximizing profits you make enough profits to make sure that uh, your employees are paid and your uh, expenses are met and uh, you have enough money to um, to do research and and to improve your services but you don't um, uh, maximize profits instead you maximize service so that's how it's uh, uh it's to be done but that's very brief we will 
maybe we will have chance to discuss more detail later. Sir, thank you, Jazakallah. Okay. Next, uh, Mohammed Faisal. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, sir, you talked about that WAF can be alternative to the contemporary institutions. So how can we start WAF? I believe that WAF institution is used in Singapore, in Thailand. How can we start this WAF institution in Pakistan? There, uh, yeah, there's a... Um, um, Effort going on. Uh, basically, the first step would be to. Uh, currently, the Waqf laws. You see, the, the when when the British came, they seized all the Waqf and uh, uh, made sure that the government can control their expenditures. And and this is the same law today, and it has not been changed. So the Islamic law of Waqf is very different from what the government uh, has put. So today. Um, to create a waqf in Pakistan requires change in laws, and there are people who are working on, on doing this. Uh, but uh, otherwise, proper Islamic waqf uh, cannot be created within the legal framework provided by the government. So there are ways to get around this. You can do this informally, and you can um, create a, a, a another corporate uh, types of structures which can sort of substitute for the waqf. Uh, but anyway, there is a problem, and uh, this problem needs to be solved. Next, Ahmed. Salaam. You'll be finished in, in seven minutes at 2.30, at 3.30. Yes, uh, Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, doctor? Um, I read your book, uh, The Polar Opposites, <laughs> and uh, I see Darul uh, Amana and uh, yes. the Waqf. What do, what's the difference between the two? And then uh, your presentation on human behavior send it via the mailing list? Yes, I'm going to send the lecture and uh, links via the mailing list. And um, as far as Darul Amana, those are uh, any concepts which, if we want to enter into the banking sector, then we need to separate the two characteristics which are merged in Western banking. Uh, you, when you, when somebody puts in money, some people want deposits; they want just want to get their money back. Other people want to invest their money into business. So these two things are done simultaneously in Western banking. And we need to separate these functions. We have to have a separate bank, which is for deposits, for safekeeping. And that is what I call Darul Amana in that book. And uh, then we have investment banks or uh, banks where you put in money and you participate in business and you then you participate in risks of business. So these two have to be entirely separate institutions. And what, what, I was... what doctor means by... Uh... Uh, creating more services so the the bank would obviously uh, earn their money from or earn a certain amount to pay the salaries for via services and not from the interest on the on the yes, deposits absolutely. basically okay absolutely so i think we have time for one last question samin it's 807 uh, sir, uh, thank you very much sir, for providing the, an opportunity to ask the question uh, you have uh, said that uh, social sciences is uh, wrongly made uh, included as a science. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, where we can place social sciences? How the name social sciences, or uh, what else category we can assign uh, social science? Social science is a religion of Europe. That's what we should assign it. This is the current religion of Europe which because of the use of the deceptive word of science has spread all over the world. Social science is the theories used to shape society. And uh, this, these come from European historical experience and they basically uh, inflict European patterns. So all over the world, by learning social science, we are trying to create our societies 
in the pattern of European societies, and this is causing vast amount of damage. And so, recognize it for what it is. It is Eurocentric social science, or it is just European religion. And then um, we can build our own uh, methods for social organization. All right, I think we still have time for one more question. Fatma Sumaru. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, uh, I'm from Pakistan and I'm an economics lecturer, professor. So yes. Can you get what is the possible and realistic roadmap to change the rational behaviors that is mostly leads to selfishness of <laughs> oneself, to have more and to, uh, to more well, on to oneself? What is the realistic road? Yeah. So, um, actually, uh, this is a very important question because actually part of the reason that greed and selfishness is spreading is because in economics, we are teaching that national behavior. So if we stop teaching that, we start teaching that this is, this is the Western theory of behavior and we don't believe it and we don't agree with it. And uh, we think that human beings should behave differently. And actually, you can show evidence that people who behave selfishly, uh, they are not happy people because uh, human beings' uh, happiness depends on social relationships. So if you're greedy and selfish, nobody will care for you and uh, you will be unhappy. But if you are generous and kind, people will care for you and love you and you will get much more happiness uh, then you could by just consuming more goods. So this is what we need to teach and we need to, uh, economics teachers have a special responsibility because they are continuously teach false theories which are in conflict with Islam. All right, this will be the last question. We are at uh, 328. Durre Ayman. Assalamu alaikum. I am from Pakistan. Mera swar, uh, currently I have uh, studying in um, International Islamic University. I have question about that. In Pakistan, the caste system is not uh, well defined, well established. So how can improve that? What of that? The what uh, system? Is a caste system. It's the caste system. Oh yes. It's not well established. And second question is also that interest is haram in uh, Islam. So teachers, uh, economics teachers especially teach about the interest and monetary policy also based on interest. So how can uh, teachers teach uh, about the interest rate when we talk about the monetary policy? Well, as far as Zakat is concerned, this is a very practical question, very important question, but um, it's not something I can answer here. It, it, uh, there are many steps that need to be taken to improve and revitalize the, uh, uh, the Zakat system. And uh, as far as the other question about the interest, yes, I have lots of work on how to do monetary, Islamic monetary policy. If you look up Islamic monetary policy in my, um, on my blog, you will be able to find uh, this. Uh, so uh, that's, um, I think, uh, all for today. We have come to the end of the time. I'm leaving a uh, um, link in the chat box for the mailing list and uh, from this mailing list yes you can uh, if you are on the mail I, I will send the materials the lecture notes and the video link and and uh, everything and also weekly updates on what to do the next live lecture will be on the first Sunday of uh, March but in the middle, we will have lots of additional uh, video lectures and trainings and readings, uh, basically on a weekly basis until um, that next live lecture. So that is all for today. May Allah Ta'ala make this effort of value for the Ummah and give us all the nur of Basira and accept us and forgive our sins and guide the Ummah out of its current darkness. Ameen. Okay, that's the end.
Okay, thank you, Professor and everyone. Uh, see you, inshallah, in the ne next month. Uh, please join our mailing list for further information. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.